In this week's update, inflation data cools off. What does that mean for stocks? Markets due for some quick profit taking. The dissenters are a godsend. My name is Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice. And please remember to like and subscribe to the video. All right, let's start with some overall market reality. It's uh, It's been about interest rates all year. Uh, that's what has spooked the market. But markets always respond to uncertainty rather than fact. And that's why we've seen this um, very, very strong rally when the news was was as bad as it's been all year and quite possibly will get a little bit worse yet. Um, it's just the way that markets work because they're forward looking. So interest rates have, have been the key. And the question is, how hard will the Fed go? Um, it's, uh, I mean, nobody knows, but I think the experience of the last decade shows that, um, that the Fed is more likely to, uh, to back off than, uh, than to push ahead. We saw that in 2018 when, uh, when Jay Powell tried to raise uh, interest rates and tighten and the market went down for three months and he had to back off. And um, I think if the market reacts uh, poorly to, to what the Fed is doing, then they'll probably end up doing the same thing again. So the question is, um, how soon will rates peak? And certainly there is a, um, there is a warming to the concept that, that rate rises are going to be less than what the Fed is actually saying and that that peak in interest rates may come sooner. <coughs> I beg your pardon. So as always, equities are going to price in those assumptions well ahead of the data. Um, so if you're waiting for the inflation data to get better, if you're waiting for, um, you know, for the news, the economic news to get better, then you're just not playing the right game. Uh, it's just the reality of, of the stock market. There's certainly enough evidence that inflation is peaking. Uh, if, we look at, um, if we look at oil and gas uh, prices, we look at food prices, uh, in particular wheat, um, there is there is plenty of evidence there that that prices have uh, have peaked and it was really no surprise to see the CPI data on Wednesday night in the States and then the PPI data on Thursday night uh, come in uh, less than what was expected because these prices have been coming off and they're the major contributors to um, to the inflation numbers. So no surprise at all, and um, and the market responded quite well to it. And bond yields for months now have been um, reflecting the fact that the the mark the bond market expected those rates to peak, and we've we've seen the ten year yield falling um, for quite a few months, as we'll see shortly. There are other risks uh, there, of course, that could uh, disrupt the equities market. Uh, Taiwan is is uh, is a real flashpoint. Uh, I don't think you can you can rule out the possibility of of war over Taiwan. Let's hope it doesn't come to that because it'll probably be pretty nasty. Um, but you'd have to factor that in as some sort of possibility. Um, but look, war somewhere these days is just the reality that that markets have to live with. And, um, you know, if you if you don't invest because there might be a war somewhere, then um, you might as well forget about equities altogether. One of the significant consequences of a war over Taiwan, of course, would be the su supply of semiconductors because um, a very significant percentage of the world's semiconductor chips come out of Taiwan. So that would be that would be a huge, huge impact. So, um, you know, let's let's hope that it doesn't uh, doesn't come to that. So I just want to show uh, a couple of charts. Um, so here's the first one. So this is the US petrol price. So when we're looking at what, what is it that's actually causing inflation and has inflation peaked and therefore has the stock market um, lows been formed? This is the petrol price and it's pretty obvious. I don't need to even talk to it. The petrol price has come off quite significantly um, in the States in the last uh, couple of uh, months. Now, if we look at um, if we look at some other charts, we'll start first of all with uh, with a 10 year yield. We finished just under 2.9, but if we go back and look at the last three months, you can see that we we peaked here in um, 
uh, just trying to pick up that date. It's uh, in uh, mid, about, around about mid June. The 10 year yield peaked at, uh, at 3.48. And since then, we've formed a series of, um, of lower highs, lower lows. And a um, bit of a tick up just uh, just in the last couple of weeks, but it's still uh, yet to, to get back above 3%, which is the key. This is the 10 year, two year spread. Um, so when this goes negative, most times there is an economic recession. And I guess technically the US is already in a mild technical recession uh, already. We're at minus 0.41, which is reasonably significant. Um, so it's likely the US um, will encounter a, um, a recession in reality rather than just a technical one within the next 12 months. And that would be another reason why the, the Fed would just would not need to proceed with the interest rate rises they're talking about. Uh, if we look at wheat prices, they've come off significantly. We we're, uh, were up around just under 1300 uh, US dollars a bushel. It's now down to 806. So when you look at these sort of uh, pieces of information, you'd have to say, well, of course, inflation um, has peaked if these sort of things are sustained. Just while I'm here, I'll just show the iron ore uh, chart because this is so integral to um, uh, to the not only the health of the Australian economy, but um, but you know our, our major um, mining stocks in in Fortescue and BHP in Rio. So we've, uh, we're at 113, which is still a very profitable, very buoyant level. And it's really the, the level that's, uh, that we were at um, about a year ago. OK. Now, just sort of moving on with some overall perspective, which is really what I try to do in this, this Sunday video every week, is, is just to provide you with a... Um, with a sensible, independent overview of the markets that's you know not necessarily that easy to, to find. Investors really do crave, in, crave certainty. You know, that's, that's how we're all wired. We like to, to feel that we're in control of things, that we know what's going to happen and that we're not going to get any surprises. Um, and it's that craving for certainty that really is behind the, you know, the the mistakes that we make in the market. But the reality is that certainty doesn't exist. All we have is weight of evidence, and it's all I've been talking about now for weeks and months, is just the building weight of evidence that the lows in mid-June were going to be the ultimate lows of the bear market and that we were um, moving back into, uh, into rally mode. And certainly at this stage, the weight of evidence continues to support that and continues to support that overwhelmingly. So if all we've got is weight of evidence, then what else do you need to go with that? You need, you need an open mind because we, we have a tendency to filter the information that we see. We filter in what we feel comfortable with, what we think should be, and we tend to filter out information that is contrary to what we think. Um, and so you've got, just got to have an open mind. And there's, you know, there's still plenty of people out there that just do not believe that this rally is sustainable in, in the face of overwhelming information. They're just filtering out what it is that they don't like, um, you know, about what they see. The second thing that you need to go with an open mind, of course, is the discipline then to have a plan, to stick to that plan and, uh, and just execute. And, um, you know, effective investing is, is a fairly straightforward process. It's just it's not easy because our head gets in the way. So the doubters, from my perspective, are, still, are actually good for us because they tend to validate the fact that we've seen the lows. When you've got a rally as significant as the one that we're in at the moment, and it's been running now for two months, in the face of bad news and in the face of the, you know, the general population just not believing it, then that adds validity to uh, to the low. I'd be far more concerned if everybody was positive and bullish at this stage. So, um, for those of you that have participated in this advance, then um, you know we probably should uh, should all thank the doubters for that. There's always a recovery process in um, coming out of bear markets in, into the resumption of, of bull markets, 
And that process is a building of confidence. And the market is still in the process of regaining confidence because there are still so many people out there that just, you know, don't believe. And it's regaining confidence about the fact that, that you know, the peak in interest rates is, is probably not that far away and it's probably not that much higher than where we are at the moment. And, and of course, once the market feels that it has a, a better handle on what things, uh, how things are unfolding, then, you know, the better off it is. Uh, the recessionary impacts, um, they, they, there are going to be recessionary impacts and there are going to be a lot of stocks that are going to be affected very badly. But the argument that I'm hearing from, from the doubters is that because some stocks are going to be significantly impacted by a recession, they assume that there's no stocks that are going to be immune, that are going to do well. Whereas in actual fact, there's, there's plenty of stocks that are going to do extremely well, even if there is a recession. So you, you just got to divorce yourself from this concept that all, all the stocks do the same thing, that they all behave like the index. And I have no idea the index might go down again, but I know that there are some stocks, the ones that I'm particularly focused on, that are going to go up no matter what. And that's just the, you know, the reality of the market. So investors require some educated confidence um, to get ahead of the masses, because if you wait for the masses to accept that we're now back into a secular bull market, then the majority of the, of the really good gains have already happened. So if you want to do well out of these sort of situations, and, and I think we've still got um, very, very attractive upside in the market, you know, it's not too late to be participating. You just require some educated confidence about um, about how things are unfolding. Let's turn to American stocks now. The S&P um, had a very strong finish. Friday night was really good and helped the index to a 3.3% rise for the week. Um, it's just looking extraordinarily bullish in, uh, in the States, I, I must say. If you look at the sector level, it's bullish. If you look at um, hundreds of charts, uh, stock charts as I do every day, then it's there are just so many really bullish uh, stock charts and I'll show you a few later on. Uh, the breadth of the American market is impressive. It's, this is not just a rally, an index rally being led by um, a handful of large uh, tech stocks. This is extremely broad. And we're also seeing plenty of intraday accumulation as well. You know, sell-offs at the at the opening, which is the you know the retail market, the less uh, the less educated market, selling off on bad news in panic, and then prices rising from there. So we're seeing a lot of intraday accumulation, which is really the it's the thumbprint of institutions that are accumulating the stock that are being sold on bad news. Um, that wasn't the case in the first five, six months of this year. Um, we were seeing institutions uh, distributing stock. They were selling into market rallies. Uh, the market would open up and then it would be sold down and you'd, you'd end up with a whole bunch of red candles. Whereas now we're seeing, we're seeing some gaps down, but then we're seeing green candles as, as the, uh, the prices rise. So plenty of intraday accumulation is very positive. Now, we've had a terrific rally for the last uh, seven, eight weeks. Uh, we've got options expiry coming up this week. It's always problematic. Uh, we've got a situation where there's a, just an extraordinary amount of uh, in the money call options. That leaves the market ripe for, for some manipulation by those who can manipulate the market prices. They've got a financial incentive to do so, and uh, if they can pull it off, they, uh, they will. So in, from my perspective, in the very short term, I'm expecting some profit taking and a bit of a pullback leading into options expiry this Friday. But look, really for investors, long-term investors, which I guess most people watching this video will be, that's really neither here nor there. That's just a, you know, it's just a very short-term impact. It's perhaps an opportunity to purchase at a, at a price which is a bit less than how we finished on Friday. So if you've not really been participating in this rally, then you might get a better opportunity in the next uh, five to seven trading days. 
US dollar index uh, fell to uh, 105.65, so a bit of pressure on the US dollar index as you know expectations about the, the pace of rate rises just um, cools off a bit. 10 year didn't really change much on the week, 2.83 is where it finished. Um, significantly, the VIX dropped below 20 for the first time since April, so that is significant. And uh, the 10 year, two year spread, as we saw, uh, remained at, um, at minus 0.41. So let's jump in and look at some charts. Sorry, let me just get that right. Okay, so this is the S&P, um, and I don't really need to say too much about this since uh, since the the um, series of breakouts that we've had that really started just right down here. Uh, the 19th of July was when we got our first higher high, um, and since the 19th of July, it's just continued to accelerate. And you can see Friday night was uh, was one of the best days that we've had since or well, you've really got to go back to the 27th of July. We'd had some selling on Thursday night and I thought that that may be the short term um, temporary end to the rally. It had run into some resistance up here around 40, 4265 um, and it closed on its lows of the session. But look at Friday, Friday was extremely buoyant. Now, the doubters might seize on this trend line and and say, well, you know, we've still got lower lower highs and uh, and lower lows at a big picture level. And that is true. But that's at a very big picture level. And if you wait for those sort of levels to get taken out, then the majority of, of the, um, the sweet spot of the rally is already gone. And that's why this weight of evidence approach that I've been um, talking about now for uh, the last six to eight weeks is so important because it allows you to take advantage of the rallies far, far earlier than if you're just relying on a, on a couple of you know, big picture indicators, um, something to do with what the moving averages are doing or, or, um, or what, uh, you know, what a bear flag formation might look like or whatever it is. No question, this is an extremely robust rally. And the key point that I would make here is that in bear markets, supports tend to break and resistance levels tend to hold. That's just the reality. And we saw plenty of that from January this year as support level after support level got broken. But in bull markets, the opposite occurs. And we're seeing that this would have been resistance. It got broken. This would have been resistance. It was broken. Same again here. So this is just typical of bull markets. So the weight of evidence overwhelmingly supports the resumption of this secular uh, bull market that started in 2013. And I've been saying for several years now that it, that it should extend to at least 2030 because that's, that's history. That's how long secular bull markets tend to run for. Now, yes, you get some significant... Um, corrections during that period. And sometimes those cyclical uh, bear markets can be uh, 30 to 50%. So the, you're not immune from significant pullbacks in the market. But at an overall big picture level, this bull market has still got a long way to run, possibly another eight to 10 years. And that's just the reality. So bear markets, cyclical bear markets are great opportunities to, um, you know, to take advantage of that. So that's the S&P, undeniably strong. We've got the shorter term moving averages now turning up. Um, the, the 20 day, the green line is, um, is moving away from the 50 very robustly. They've both turned up and the index is almost back above the, uh, the 200 day. Uh, if we look at the NASDAQ, we're, we're certainly forming higher highs and higher lows now and the shorter term moving averages are, are doing very much the same thing. Hasn't quite caught up to the 200 day yet because it had fallen further than the S&P. But as we'll see on the spread charts, it's regaining that ground very quickly. The Russell 2000 for small caps, just to show that this is very broadly based. We've clearly gone through this resistance. Just think back to what I said just a minute ago in, in bull markets, resistance levels tend to break. 
um, support levels tend to hold. So we've certainly seen a break of a very significant resistance level here, and it's gone on with it very, very strongly. And if you look at the the individual stock level, there are just so many positive small cap and mid cap stock charts in America. And if you even look at Kathy Wood's ARC funds, which have been absolutely murdered in the last uh, 18 months since the start of 2021, these are all the uh, the concept stocks that um, that had you know no visibility on future earnings, even those ETFs are turning up now. So you know it just shows you that money is going back into those parts of the market, and that would not be happening if we were stuck in some sort of protracted uh, bear market. Moving now to the important spread charts, this is the Nasdaq versus the S and P. Didn't change a lot during last week so that was a market rally that was across the board it was money was flowing into you know absolutely everything but it certainly didn't lose ground so we've still got this continued rotation back into growth which is the hallmark of bull markets and you can argue against it all you like if if this you know if what i'm saying doesn't fit your view of the world but you know that's the reality that's where money is going this is consumer discretionary. This is a really important chart. Consumer discretionary versus staples, no question. Money is flowing um, at a greater rate into consumer discretionary. I'm sorry, that's uh, US mid caps versus the S&P. No denying, that's a very, very strong trend. The Russell 1000 growth versus 1000 value. Not a lot of change last week, but again, still it's still maintaining a very significant um, higher highs and higher lows. Uh, US small caps, small cap growth versus small cap value, still forming higher highs and higher lows. And this is, sorry, US large caps, uh, large cap growth versus large cap value on a weekly chart. Um, and we have now broken what would have been resistance. This is a key resistance level here, and it got easily broken. So you've just, you know, you've got to, Take note of that and um, and acknowledge it. Looking at the um, currencies, this is the US dollar. We peaked in the middle of July at <coughs> big pardon at 109. Pulled back to uh, so we're back to around 105 at the moment, and that of course has uh, meant the Australian dollar has has gone in the opposite direction, and we've managed just to claw our way back above 70 cents. On the uh, on the Aussie dollar. So wrapping up for Aussie stocks, 7054 is our dollar. Our index rose 0.2 percent across the week. Not a lot of change, um, but certainly the breadth has been pretty impressive. We're, we're getting participation from most of the Australian market. So you know that that breadth is is always important, and of course, earnings season has probably panned out a little bit better than than many people expected. Turning now to precious metals, uh, gold was up by twenty seven dollars to eighteen oh three, um, which translates to two five five seven in Australian dollars. That's actually lower than last week, and that's because the currency went up. Um, but it's still, you know, a very buoyant, very profitable uh, level. But poor old precious metal stocks on the global stage just, um, just you know, can't get a break at the moment. And the stocks were relatively weak considering how much gold improved. So let's go and take a look at those charts. But before I go there, I actually just want to show um, a few other US stock charts just to sort of reinforce this point. Um, first of all, this is the mid cap index, the, the mid cap 400 ETF. Um, so again, just to reinforce the breadth of this move, but let's look at some, uh, some key um, US individual stocks. This is Apple, you know, what a stunning rise this has been since the middle of, uh, the middle of June. It's gone from 130 to 170 plus, and it's gone up in a, at a very steep, uh, incline. So that's very impressive. This is Amazon gapped out on their earnings results and has been able to hold that uh, that gap up, 
hasn't come back and um, and filled that gap. So that's a real sign of strength with Amazon. Microsoft now forming higher highs and higher lows and looking much better. Just a couple of sectors to check in on. This is the technology sector. So again, higher highs and higher lows. This is consumer discretionary, same same situation. So wherever you look in the US market, you, there's just signs of strength anywhere. There's no denying that this um, that the lows the lows are in based on the weight of evidence. Now something could come along and disrupt all this. You know, if if tensions over Taiwan escalate, or the you know the Fed says something that the market doesn't like, then this can change. But if that happens, then we change our stance. You know, it's as simple as that. But you don't stay out of the market, in my opinion, because something might happen. There's been a tremendous rally underway here, and um, you know, there's been an opportunity to uh, to repair any damage that was done during the previous six months. Okay, let's just look at uh, the gold price now. So this is gold on a, a daily basis. So you can see we've we've moved off the lows. It was quite a nice reversal on the 21st of July when we were down in the, the low 1700s and now we're, we're back up to 1803. And just trying to break through what is likely to be some resistance. So we're very close to it at the moment. So I think that that's important for um, for the gold uh, perspective. Looked at on a weekly chart, we're still really in this big consolidation range that um, where the, the first peak formed in August of 2020. So we're, we're now two years into a sideways band for gold. And the fact that um, the gold stocks are only doing this um, is, um, you know, is telling. They're, they're looking, they're looking pretty ordinary. If we look at GDXJ, the the juniors, then um, you know, there's there's nothing encouraging about um, about those particular charts. So that's uh, that's the precious metal space. Turning to other commodities, uh, copper is still recovering from the, the absolute <coughs> smashing that it got in, um, in uh, from April through to, to June when fears about global recession really ramped up. Uh, we're back to 365 now and nickel has also recovered back to 1027. Just looking at copper, um, and this came from the S&P Global Market Intelligence, copper is heading for a 3.8 million ton shortfall by 2025. This is when... Um, this is when it's being predicted that um, that copper, um, the, the copper demand will just completely outstrip the ability to supply. And, um, you know, that that is what the market will at some point in the next year or two will really start to grasp and, and price in the fact that we've got this massive shortfall that's that's looming. And the, the key issue here is that supply never becomes available as fast as people would like to think it it's going to be. You know, the reality is that mines just take a lot longer to um, you know to move from from discovery to actual production, and large scale mines, which are ones that are actually going to make a difference in the supply and demand equation, you know, they're the ones that take a decade or more. To bring on stream, so you, you can't just say, "Oh, well, we know that there's this huge supply um, gap coming in in three years. We'll, you know, the supply will just ramp up to meet it." Well, it just doesn't work that way. It's going to take a lot, lot longer. So it's almost certain that copper is going to join the list of other metals that are that are going to be um, in short supply, and therefore prices are going to go up. Which means that um, that the profits of uh, of the miners are uh, are almost certainly going to go up as well. Crude oil is higher to ninety one point nine. Um, the volatility though is settling down. I think it was only about a six or seven dollar range uh, across the week. Spot copper, you can see the recovery there from from the lows um, that we had in uh, in July. 
And if we look at the inventories on a five-year basis, the, the inventories, are, and they're nothing flash. They're nothing like what we had back in, um, in 2018 and 2019. And there is definitely a trend down there in inventory. So we're already getting tight on inventories. And from here, the supply demand situation just gets more and more pressured and reaches an extreme by 2025. And, um, and the, you know, the major copper producers are, uh, are going to start to get the benefit of that. So this is nickel, didn't fall as far, so the recovery has not been as significant. And it's being swamped out by this, uh, this peak that occurred here in, um, in March. But if we look at the inventories on a five-year basis, nickel inventories uh, are, are pretty slim as well. We're, we're down, in fact, I've, it would appear from that chart that we're setting, we're setting new five-year lows in inventory levels. So, of course, the prices are, are, going, to be, uh, are going to be more buoyant. Wrapping it up. Contrarian thinking at the extremes um, often pays off. Um, you've, you know, you've got to be you've got to be educated in in the contrarian position that you take because a lot of contrarian positions don't work out. But when when we get extremes in sentiment and behaviour like we saw in um, May and June, then you really want to have your contrarian antennas up and and be looking for the weight of evidence that you know would support an end to that extreme and a reversal in that extreme. The, and the last two months has been the most graphic example of using a sequential weight of evidence of approach to advantage because if you're just looking at the market through the lens that most people do, then it was incredibly difficult to buy over the last six to eight weeks. But if you acknowledged what was staring us in the face about where money was flowing, then, you know, there were opportunities all over the place. And um, we've, had, um, we've had some extremely buoyant uh, recoveries in, uh, in stock prices. There is a, a massive mid-decade metal shortage looming. Um, I don't think there's any question about that now. And so there are just some amazing bargains to be had. Now, there'll be a lot of volatility between now and 2025, but if you've got a plan to deal with that volatility, then I'm convinced that there is a great deal of money to be made in that, in that period. You've just got to be organised and disciplined and shut out the noise and, uh, and stick to your plan. Portfolio analysts last week, uh, we looked at healthcare opportunities, both in Australia and in America. Um, and we also looked at some other general US opportunities as well. So another pretty good session in Portfolio Analyst. Which for anybody who hasn't taken the $1 trial for two weeks can, um, can avail themselves of that and, um, and see if you like what we do in that service. There's more information on the website. There's my email address and uh, I'll be back with you next Sunday. Cheers. <music>